Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism. Just to my right, we have Jean Lemire, who's a senior advisor, among other things, to the chief executive of BNP. On his right is Andrea Enria, who chairs the European Banking Authority. And then on the far right, or my far right, is Vitor Costancio, the vice president of the ECB. I think um, I was very pleased to be asked to uh, chair this panel because I think it goes to the heart of so much of what's going on in the European economy generally, the world economy, and certainly in terms of the future of the European banking sector, the, the outlook for the regulatory um, uh, setup here is key. It's been um, an amazing few years, um, as uh, will have escaped nobody. I was at a dinner last night with um, a selection of, uh, of, of U.S. bankers and uh, former U.S. Treasury officials in London. And um, they were on a kind of trip to Europe and feeling very pleased with themselves, looking around and saying how bleak Europe still looked, um, talking about how amazing the rebound was in the U.S. banking sector, uh, how successful TARP was uh, in terms of helping uh, that rebound in the U.S. banks um, going back now four years. Um, Europe, sadly, is still mired in a lot of the after effects of the crisis, but I think the next 12 months is going to be key um, in terms of the ECB's asset quality review and the EBA's stress test to see whether we can finally pull the sector out of, uh, of its troubles. So, um, I mean, that's, a, that's the core of what we're here to talk about. And I wonder if maybe we, um, I could ask Andrea to say a, a few words to start on looking back over the previous year or so um, and the, the attempts of the authorities to um, rebuild confidence in, among investors uh, and among everybody, really, in, in the health of the, of the European banking sector. Do you think, um, well, would you say you're pleased with the progress that's been made so far? Well, I, I think that there is, uh, let's say, if you look at the data, no? I mean, you take the, 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 the main benchmark, which is used now to, to look at the uh, resilience of, of banks, uh, the common equity to one ratio. You take the common equity to one ratio of the largest uh, 20 banks in Europe and the largest 20 banks in the US, and you see that uh, the uh, European banks are actually stronger in terms of capital. Uh, uh, however, the narrative, which is uh, uh, reflected also in the talk with your, let's say, U.S. Uh, counterparts yesterday, is that uh, European banks have done uh, uh, less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, raising of fresh capital. Uh, they have done, uh, they have done more, let's say, adjustments through risk-weighted assets, which is a concept which is not really considered fully reliable. Uh, they've done less deleveraging, so actually there is, uh, there is uh, still a lot of uh, long way to go. I think that this, uh, this narrative is uh, not, uh, uh, not correct, it's not reflected in facts. I mean, in fact, if you look at the data, if you take again the 20 largest European banks and the 20 largest U.S. banks, it's interesting that at the beginning of the crisis in 2008, they had approximately the same amount of capital, nominal capital, around 550 billion each. And uh, uh, the increase in nominal amount of capital at the European banks has been much higher. Uh, it is true that the U US banks have raised more fresh capital, they've done more retained earnings, but they've also done more buybacks of capital. And uh, uh, so I think that in terms of capital, let's say the, 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 the progress has been substantive, and I think also this is thanks to the recapitalization exercise that we conducted in 2011 and, uh, and, uh, and 12. Um, in terms of, uh, let's say, deleveraging, I think it is true that uh, up to a certain point, uh, 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 let's say, European banks have shown a, an incredible stickiness in their, in their balance sheet side. On aggregate, of course, a lot has occurred in terms of redistribution across banks and countries, but on aggregate, if you take the European banks, the balance sheet size was uh, remaining rather rather sticky uh, there, while the, the U.S. banks also relying on the role played by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, let's say, were downloading uh, assets and, uh, and uh, trimming down their, their balance sheet size. Um, but I must say that this process, uh, since, uh, uh, since the summer last year, has started also in, uh, in Europe. And again, if you take the top 20 banks, uh, 
according to our data, the total assets shrank uh, around 7%, which is 1.5 trillion euro in the last, uh, in the last year only. Um, and we have seen also starting uh, sales of business lines, sales of portfolios of assets. Uh, uh, you see more capital issues. My impression is that there is uh, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, improvements which is, uh, which is taking place. You see also an increase in provisions. So the, 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 there has been a process of cleaning of the balance sheets which has uh, taken speed, in my view, also in preparation to the uh, asset quality review and, uh, and the, and the um, let's say, the, the, the stress test of, uh, of uh, next year. And as a result, I see that also the market perception is improving if you take the price to book ratio of European banks, which is, has been the signal in my view that uh, there was a lack of confidence in European banks. This has been picking up uh, steadily in the, last, uh, in the last months. It's still uh, a bit lagging behind, but uh, it, has, uh, it has improved also for euro area banks. And the uh, market indicators of uh, uh, the fall probability, like the expected default frequencies, have been coming down and uh, reducing in volatility. So I think that things are, are improving. Uh, sometimes, I, I think on this, for instance, Jean Lemire would probably agree up to now, but let's say maybe, let's say, uh, looking at this situation, the, the type of feedback from the industry is, well, we have done a lot, we need to basically stop here, uh, we've done our homework, and this is, uh, the adjustment is completed. Uh, my, my impression is that uh, uh, we need to complete the process. So we need to finalize uh, the pieces of uh, regulations uh, that need to, uh, let's say, complete the adjustment process. And especially, we need to um, address uh, the uh, remaining uh, concern that there might be pockets of vulnerability in terms of asset quality and in terms of risk weighted assets. And this is a point which we are doing with our work on risk weighted assets and the asset quality review that especially the, the ECB will uh, uh, run uh, in, uh, in a few weeks and months, uh, let's say, will be, will be a, key, a key way forward. Well, we come on to talk about that in more depth in a moment. But I just wondered, um, Jean Lemire, the BNP, in a way, is a, is a perfect case study of, of that backward-looking uh, portrait that Andrea was just painting there in terms of um, banks uh, across the region having had to do some fairly drastic restructuring of balance sheets. Um, and, uh, and BNP is probably among the most extreme in terms, of, in terms of that story. Give us your perspective. I mean, has it been a good thing that you've had this pressure from, from all sides to, to do this? Yes, it's not easy, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think I would like to, to give uh, a slightly different tone to the uh, vision we had. Uh, I think BNP Paribas has done the job uh, not so much to deleverage as such. Of course, we have deleveraged. But that was not the real game. The real game is that we made the view in 2009 that there was a new paradigm decided by policymakers and regulators about the way the Europe European economy was to be funded. We have been living forever on a paradigm based on the balance sheet of the banks. And in fact, in 2009, all the discussions, the technical discussions, were pointing at a policy point, which is we don't want this any longer. We want a more Anglo-Saxon, if I may use that word, model of funding the economy, mainly through the markets. Th that's the beginning of the thinking of BNP Paribas, which is, this is what we need to do. And the first step, of course, is we deleverage. We need to have smaller balance sheets. We need to be less uh, sizable. And this is what we have done extremely early. It has been done very quickly and massively in BNP Paribas. Now, is it painful? Yes, it is painful, because it's extremely difficult to ask people who have been working the whole of their life building assets suddenly to get rid of the assets. It is difficult. But it is a change of policy, a change of business model, and that was clear. What were the targets? You have mentioned them. Uh, 
definitively to increase the capital ratios. Quickly, just to give you a figure on BNP Paribas, between 1850 or 1860 and 2008, we have accumulated 28 billion. Today, we have as a capital 70 billion. It shows that in five years, we have created, quote unquote, more capital than in 150 years. Where does it come from? We have sold assets and we have put into reserves the profits of the bank. And we have a sizable uh, profit generation capacity and we have used this quickly to be at the standard, I will not say at the best standard, but very high standard uh, in Europe. The other point we had was liquidity. And liquidity, both in euro and dollar, is a very important question. And we had to improve, and we have done it, the liquidity situation of BNP Paribas. I must say that during this time, uh, BNP Paribas has bought and merged with Fortis, and it has helped a lot this type, solving this type of question. Now, I would like to finish by one point. I've started by a policy point. But behind the policy point, there is a mission point. The mission of the banks is to finance the economy, not to make profits for themselves, but to finance the economy. It's not too difficult to deleverage. What is difficult is to deleverage, to increase the capital ratios, and to continue to fund the economy and avoid a credit crunch. And this is incredibly difficult. I'm not so sure that the Europe has, is at the end of that process. But we are in a process in which we need to shift from balance sheet to market. It's being done more quickly than I did expect, but it's being done. But step by step, we have been extremely committed to the clients, not, not to squeeze them. Now, how you do it? You know, you have to make choices. And of course, when you deleverage, you decide to make low, less credit to some areas, to some business lines, to some customers, and more to others. The clear choice we have made is to protect and even increase what we do in what we call domestic markets, which is not only France. But it's clear that this is exactly what we have done over the last years, which is difficult. Deleverage, maintain the uh, supply of credit to the customers, and at the end of the day, try to make money, but I'll come back to that question later. Yeah, the challenge, as you say, will be to try and build up the alternative financing of so much of that corporate uh, funding through the capital markets, which is, so I, I would say we're probably halfway through that cycle, but um, we should come back uh, later to talk about that crucial thing. I was wondering if I could just turn to Thomas, maybe uh, briefly, on, on this backward-looking uh, question of you know, w what have we achieved up to now. Um, BNP and, and fr French banks generally are uh, good examples of institutions that have, um, partly through um, necessity, deleveraged a lot and changed their, their funding structures a lot. Um, I'm not sure that right across the EU we've seen um, reinvention of banks to quite the same degree, but I just wonder how uh, um, diversified you see the progress that banks have made um, across the EU? Right. I think what uh, we have heard from Jean is maybe not representative of the whole uh, sector as a whole uh, in Europe or in, or in the Euro area. And uh, as a matter of fact, performance has been quite uh, differentiated and has partly also been influenced by the supervisory fragmentation that we uh, have been experiencing in Europe. And if you think back to uh, 2008, uh, with a very strong interaction between supervisors, regulators, uh, finance ministries, and the individual bank, uh, there was a very strong undertow uh, to do as little recapitalization as was possible in order not to change the business model, which would have been the result of state aid action coming out of Brussels. So 
whilst it is not true for each and every bank, and whilst it is not true for each and every country, the supervisory fragmentation, especially in the euro area of 17 supervisors, uh, one central bank, of course, uh, led to the fact uh, that hardly anybody, because of official action, was forced to change the business model. What would the changing of the business model have entailed? Well, I think more or less what John was describing. Uh, it would have been the, uh, the sale of uh, foreign subsidiaries. Uh, it would have been a uh, reduction uh, to the core uh, of more conventional uh, business activities. It would have brought about a smaller sector, but it would have brought about uh, a sector which would have been forced had this not been the case. Had we had, for example, one single supervisor, uh, we would have uh, had a uh, uh, significantly accelerated uh, write-down uh, process, and I believe we would have been back on track uh, for higher lending, higher growth uh, than, than we actually are. So there are, of course, there's never one reason why one is in crisis, and there is never one reason why one does not emerge more rapidly out of crisis. But I do think that this very fragmented landscape of supervision uh, has a much larger responsibility for the slowness with which we're coming out of all of this than most people realize. So you're presumably very happy about the direction of things now and the upcoming process to create that single supervising mechanism. And you think that that should be the final, just to come back to my initial comments about the US and the TARP, are, are we finally gonna see that European version of that TARP effect come through? I think it would be a mistake to look at a uh, carbon copy of uh, TARP and TALF and uh, so on and so forth um, because of the very different circumstances. Uh, things are much more, financial market stability has been essentially regained and that was not the case uh, at, at that stage uh, in the US. Uh, the US has one regulator, they've got the FDIC, they've got a lender of last resort and the spender of last, one spender of last resort, one lender of last resort. Mm -hmm. So we are a monetary union. We are not a fiscal union, uh, but we have very strong uh, institutions. And I think with the single supervisor, uh, we've made a huge step uh, in uh, unifying uh, the European financial market, which incidentally uh, is a single market concept. There are only one or two islands which believe that this has something to do with the monetary union. I think you know the island. So uh, uh, let us pretend it has something to do uh, with monetary union. And yes, uh, I think given the different circumstances we will be in in 2014, uh, there will be a high degree of similarity in economic effect in what uh, the single supervisor will be doing, even though it looks totally different, but the situation will be different. Okay, well, let's hope you're right. But um, if I could just turn to Vito Constantiu now for a, for a second, because uh, throwing forward a year from, from now to that period when this, the SSM uh, officially will, will, will begin, I guess, on the back of the asset quality review that the ECB is, is um, starting to undertake, um, that clearly is, is a crucial um, period now for the ECB's credibility, for the credibility of Eurozone banks generally. Um, what, what will it take in terms of uh, your view of, of the, this process for it to be considered a success? What, how will you be measuring the, the success of the AQR? <coughs> well, the success of uh, the comprehensive assessment, uh, as we call it, that includes several aspects, uh, the main two being the asset quality review and the stress test uh, that we will conduct in cooperation in the uh, later case uh, with EBA, uh, is indeed to dispel, uh, we hope, once and for all, any um, misperceptions about the uh, situation of the European banking sector. Um, and Ria just uh, went through some indicators that prove that when we consider the uh, evolution of the situation of the European banks uh, um, until recently, 
Uh, indeed, they have improved a lot their situation, both in terms of uh, capital, um, and uh, he quoted the top 20 banks, and these are their, his numbers, uh, is that in net terms, meaning deducting uh, the uh, uh, share buybacks that the American banks did in a huge, uh, significant way and not European banks, then the net increase of capital, real capital, in nominal amount of uh, uh, dollars uh, in this case, is that from 08 until the end of last year, the top 20 European banks increased their capital by 289 billion, uh, whereas the top 20 American banks increased their capital by 168 billion only, deducting the share buybacks. Uh, so the actual increase in capital was much uh, higher in what regards the large European banks. Also, if you compare leverage ratios uh, with the proper use of the same accounting rules, uh, then you also uh, uh, conclude that the leverage ratios as measured in this case, uh, not as a multiplier, but as uh, tangible equity over tangible assets, they, the figures are also comparable between the big European banks and the big American ones. And this has been recognized by the market gradually because since May we have seen that uh, stock prices of European banks have increased a lot, uh, more so than the American ones during the same period of time. Uh, and uh, so there is gradual recognition by the market, by the capital market, that indeed the European banks have improved their their situation. But there are still some lingering doubts. Not so much right now about these capital positions because they are clear and uh, uh, there has been even a publication by the FDIC comparing the top European and American banks on the same accounting rules and uh, it proves uh, what I just referred to. So not so much about that, but about still lingering doubts about valuations in the balance sheet, uh, that there would be even losses there to be recognized, uh, and so on. So, and we want to dispel these uh, remaining doubts about European banks, and whatever we found has to be corrected. And so from the end of our exercise, we will measure our success in uh, convincing investors and the markets that indeed the European banks are in a robust situation after our exercise. So that's indeed the objective. There is a problem though, if, you, if I may, which is the following. Uh, banks have been anticipating this exercise because it has been announced for quite some time. So they have been front-loading a lot of measures in order to uh, not be caught by the exercise. So they have increased provisions uh, in some countries, significantly so. They have increased capital. Uh, they have deleveraged and uh, uh, proceed to uh, um, sell assets. Indeed, if you just take the total numbers for the uh, um, banks of the Euro area, uh, as a whole, all the banks, uh, since May last year, they have deleveraged 3.3 trillion, 9% of uh, their total balance sheet. Half of this, though, was basically in the derivatives book because there is, uh, um, an, at, uh, at this moment, there is a development among all the big banks, including the American ones, to shrink the derivatives book and to settle among themselves what is on the money uh, in order, I, I suppose, there is speculation, in order to uh, enhance their leverage ratios uh, by shrinking that derivatives book. Uh, but it is happening, a lot of deleveraging, uh, which has affected several things, but not so much credit. Credit in Europe is, in the area area, uh, is still going down, but uh, not by huge amounts. So that's not the main uh, driver of deleveraging. Uh, but it's other factors. So banks have been preparing uh, in a big way. Part of the effects of conducting such an exercise are already there, uh, already achieved. This raises the question of 
uh, at the end, our uh, communication and the credibility of our exercise. And this uh, then uh, led us to define a very strong governance of the process. First, that there is strong control by the center of the whole process in uh, issuing the instructions for the way the uh, exercise has to be conducted and ver verifying the quality of the results at the end, comparing them across countries and banks. And the second element is to involve all along uh, private expert firms in the process, external auditors, consultants, specialized firms in valuing uh, specific types of assets and so on. So these will provide the credibility, whatever the result, we don't know the result, uh, but perhaps banks already have done a lot to anticipate and are better prepared now to face the stress of the uh, exercise, but it will be credible. So the, the ECB, will not allow its reputation to be put into question uh, in this exercise. And we have surrounded all the, the, the preparations and the planning of the exercise to ensure that the governance will be uh, indeed a guarantee of that credibility. Just if I could, a couple of follow-ups on, on those points. Yeah. Um, as, as I said at the beginning, I think you know, this, this is a very closely watched exercise, and as you say, the, the credibility of the ECB is, is being closely watched as well. But um, I think for the time being, the market is still uncertain about details of the exercise. Yeah. What, w can you say a little bit about when uh, more information will be supplied about yep. parameters and about actually who will be heading this process as well, because you're recruiting, obviously, at the moment? Yeah. Uh, well. As I said, the exercise has a strong uh, control uh, by the center, uh, and we have recruited already people, and we have also the help of a consultant ourselves. Uh, but in detail, the, the uh, asset quality review and so on will be conducted under the uh, um, supervision of the national authorities, of course, uh, in the terms of the templates and methodologies that we will be uh, issuing and then monitoring how they are applied. Uh, so a lot of, uh, uh, of the work, of the actual work, going into the banks and uh, sampling the uh, different elements of the, 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 their balance sheet, their assets, and all types of assets will be analyzed, including the securities portfolio, uh, in particular in what regards level three uh, assets, level three uh, securities, uh, just valued by the banks themselves. So all that will be done uh, under uh, our uh, supervision. And we have communicated now some uh, general ideas about the process. We, will, we are planning to communicate more by the end of January. Um, so we will have uh, another round of communication going into more details. We already have uh, now issued to the banks the templates with the data requests necessary for the uh, AQR. So the banks are receiving that. Um, and they have now some time to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to respond. And then we have to assess the quality of their uh, answers and so on. And uh, then we will go into a phase of data integrity validation, which is a very important uh, part of uh, asset quality review. So the whole phases will proceed and we will communicate uh, more details also about the stress test. We hope that we can reach uh, 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 an agreement within EBA to be able to communicate also by the end of January something else about the stress test and about the uh, further details about the asset quality review. And, and just a, a final word on the governance. Um, you're yeah. rec recruiting at the moment. Uh, yeah, we are recruiting, but uh, as I say, the, in terms of resources, resources um, to the, uh, for, for the exercise of the AQR will be recruited mostly at national yeah. level. But so when, will, when will we know about the chairperson? That's sorry? Question. When will we know about the chairperson of the, uh, of the supervisory board that will... Well, uh, I think uh, uh, shortly because uh, there are uh, delays that are foreseen uh, for the procedure to, to, uh, to, to go on. 
uh, and uh, we are actively, we have reached an agreement with Parliament uh, about those procedures, and, and so we, uh, we plan and we anticipate that the uh, European Council will be in a position to take the final decision about the appointment uh, by uh, in December. Okay. Um, that's uh, what we are planning for, and uh, we think we will achieve it. Okay, very good. Um, if I could turn to Klaus, um, because um, obviously one of the crucial aspects that's been very hotly debated around this whole AQR process is uh, what happens uh, when banks fail uh, either that mm -hmm. process or, or the, the subsequent stress tests, uh, and to what degree there should be a um, backstop um, fund in place to, uh, to help with any bailouts that are necessary. Obviously, uh, we've probably a lot of everybody here is familiar with the uh, debate that's taken place between s certain member states who uh, are very keen that there should be bail-in of bondholders and no more public money put into these institutions, but, and even if there, there, there needs to be any public money, it should be injected at a national level. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, that the ECB and more recently the Commission generally seems to be of a view that no, there should be a, a centralized pot. Uh, you're in perhaps the unfortunate position of being in charge of, of, of the pot that was put in place to uh, inject money into, into sovereign uh, uh, countries that, that needed it and therefore this is the pot of money that everyone's fighting about. What's your perspective on, on how key that is and, and where we'll end up? Well, first, before I answer your question, what might happen in the future in the context of banking union, where of course the ESM will play a certain role, it's also important to look back because it's often not realized that in a way EFSF and ESM are already the backstop now also for banks. EFSF and ESM have supported and we are supporting five countries. We have committed 240 billion euro to these five countries. 215 billion euro have been paid out during the last two and a half years. Out of this 240 billion committed, about 110 billion euro was earmarked for banks. For instance, in the Greek program, 140 billion euro, 50 billion was earmarked for banks. And it was, of course, lent to the Greek government, but it was earmarked and they passed it on to the HFSF to restructure the largest Greek banks. And that has happened to a large extent. The Spanish program, as you all know, was only for restructuring the Spanish banks. And if you add it all up, so out of the 240 billion, 110 billion for banks. So that's but, the but big the point amount of money already. Absolutely, but the point that critics make of that whole structure is that uh, injecting the money via the sovereign uh, intensifies the link between banks and sovereigns, which is the precisely the thing that we need to break if um, we're to ever I think the word process. intensifies is wrong, um, although I read it all the time, because um, if it had come directly from the governments without our help, it would have been much more expensive and that would have maybe intensified the link. Um, we provide very cheaply the financing, um, so the link gets less. It's not broken, but the link is less than without EFSF and ESM money. I think that's important to realize. So that's what has happened. Um, already large support earmarked for banks. Now what will happen in the future? The ESM will play a role. Last week, Friday, the ECOFIN Council issued a statement um, talking about backstops in the banking union, and the ESM is mentioned several times. Um, the first point is that ESM will continue to provide its normal instruments, which are the ones I just described. So there can be also in the future, of course, that will continue to be our main instrument. There can be macroeconomic adjustment programs. I don't see any one happening, but, but um, even when this crisis is over, there will be a next crisis one day. So this instrument is available um, and it can, as in the past, have significant um, banking element. Second, um, there can be the indirect bank um, recapitalization schemes, bank like in Spain. Um, and the finance ministers made a reference to what they had decided earlier in the year and what also Euro area summits have talked about, the direct bank recapitalization. It still requires 
um, illegal vote, a unanimous decision by, by the Board of Governors of the Euro Area, Board of Governors of the ESM, those are the finance ministers, um, but they reconfirmed that this is um, under consideration. Of course, precondition is also that the SSM is up and running, um, and if it ever were to be used, this new instrument, it would only come as a last line of defense after the national um, resources have been used, including possibly national um, um, backstops, which um, countries are committed to create if they don't <coughs> exist already. Um, and then there has to be a unanimous decision. So these are the possibilities. There's also um, in the corridors um, sometimes rumors that the ESM should also be a backstop for the single resolution um, fund. If there's a single resolution mechanism, there should also be a single resolution fund. Um, but this is um, not yet discussed in the official circles as many other things of the banking union are not finalized. We are in the middle of a process and it's not easy to say where exactly this process will end. If I could just turn quickly to Vitor and also to Andrea for, to, for a quick riposte on, yep. on those comments. And are you happy with where this debate has got to the, in terms of the finance minister's readiness uh, to, to uh, be the backstop? Well, uh, as we said all along, uh, uh, provided that there was a uh, clear, explicit and public commitment, as it was the case, by finance ministers that uh, in the end they would provide uh, any public uh, debt uh, backstops that would be necessary as a last resort uh, in the correction of what uh, may be found out in uh, our assessment, we, we uh, would be satisfied. We were not at this stage uh, demanding for more because we knew that the member states already had decided and announced publicly that the direct European recapitalization could only occur after the single European supervisor would be uh, in place and starting to supervise. So that was already known. So to, to be clear, um, you, you are satisfied now? Yes. yes. Uh, if you want just a yes or no, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Andrea? Well, yes. That, uh, <laughs> sorry, that doesn't mean that we would not, uh, you know, uh, prefer a little more, but uh, yeah. we are satisfied. No, I, I must say, let's say, we uh, wrote uh, a, a letter back in 2011 to the predecessor of Thomas, uh, the EFC, uh, in the summer of 2011, asking already then for having a European backstop, for having the then, uh, let's say, the, 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 the European backstop being activated uh, with a view to, let's say, have a more European control also on the restructuring process that was needed in the European banking sector. And, and I think that that, that is, a, is a fair point. I, I'm happy. I think that the, 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 the Council statement went very far in terms yes. of uh, setting up the, 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 the steps to get to a, to a fully integrated European setting. So I'm completely happy with that. What I'm saying is that uh, the slow pace with what, with what we, have get, we are getting there has meant that we have had a restructuring process which has been to a large extent, uh, let's say, national. I mean, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, uh, mergers, for instance, which have occurred exclusively on a national basis. Uh, we have seen a lot of restructuring which has occurred only on a national basis. And to me, let's say, this has also Im embodied a little bit of a bias towards, uh, let's say, less exit from the market, no, then it would have been uh, ideally uh, desirable. I think Jorgas Nussen published an interesting uh, set of data. I mean, he showed, uh, uh, he, he referred to these data that the FDIC is publishing regularly, you know, on how many banks they have resolved in the US. And the figure is staggering, you know, 500 banks against around 40 in the, in the, in the European Union. Uh, at the same time, let's say, of these, 400, for these 500 banks have not exited market, market creating disruptions. I mean, 450 of them have been, their assets and liability have been bought by other banks, mm -hmm. and they suppose not banks in the same uh, state, in a sense, no? So this means that uh, if you have a more European direction to this process, you could have maintained more integration, let's say, in the single market and have a more uh, decisive 
progress in reducing excessive capacity, which is what you need to do after any crisis in any industry, and you need to reduce excess capacity. And the, on this, we have been a bit slow, in my view. And the, the lack of European backstops has something to do with that. Let's look forward a little. Um, Jean, if I could turn back to you in terms of the, the business model that we're going to see from, from banks going forward. Um, you talked um, enthusiastically about uh, the um, keenness of, of banks like yours to um, move from a balance sheet-based um, funding of, of uh, corporate Europe um, to a more capital markets-based economy, uh, which is something that um, policymakers have talked about for years and years and years that you know Europe should emulate the U.S. balance, um, which is typically talked about as um, I don't know 80% uh, capital markets funded, 20% bank funded, uh, whereas in Europe traditionally we've been the inverse of that. Um, we, we should move towards that, and maybe we end up at 50/50 or something. What, where do you think we'll end up, and and is it why is it credible now that this shift will happen? Even if we have de deleveraged, is, isn't Europe far too complex a, a, a place to um, artificially push companies and, and banks towards uh, reliance on capital markets? Well, uh, <coughs> I don't know if I have any specific uh, enthusiasm for, for this. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I would say it in the front. I repeat myself. This is a decision made by policymakers and regulators. And it is in the making. A uh, few years ago, we had the uh, split you, you have given. I would say that today, uh, the role of the banks is no longer 75 to 80, but probably close to two thirds. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this in all the European economies. It is done, it is in the making. So we, we should not think it will not happen. This is no longer business as usual. Uh, is it good or bad? We may have a long debate about this but it has been decided, and the role of the banks is to implement this as smoothly as possible. Because once more, the guys who may be hurt are the, uh, the corporate sector and th the people who create value and jobs, not the banks. So we have to understand that this is, this is done. In that landscape, I think we have one unknown question, we have two challenges, and probably we have one hope. The, the unknown is the rate of growth. Uh, why do I say this? Because if at any stage, and hopefully quickly, uh, we have a slightly higher rate of growth, we know by experience that then uh, the supply of credit to the economy must be high. Otherwise, growth will be killed. So it is crucial that within this trend, adaptation, we keep in mind that we need to be alert and be ready to supply credit if needed. So that's the unknown, which is crucial. Uh, the, the two challenges, I think we have two big challenges in the banking industry, uh, beyond the uh, cleaning and adaptation. One is the cost of investment banking. Investment banking is absolutely crucial to succeed in transforming the way the economy is funded. And it has to be affordable for the middle stand, to make it simple. And this is not yet the case, it's rather costly. And that will change the banking industry. It means saving money, cutting costs, building platforms, uh, serving a larger number of clients, probably merging platforms. So we are probably at the beginning of the big trend in investment banking. Uh, I'm, I must say uh, that BNP Paribas is very active in Germany and we see in Germany what's happening. There is more and more demand for these type of services, but once more at an affordable cost. So that will drive a lot of changes in the banking industry beyond the regulatory uh, adaptation. The second big challenge we have is probably retail banking, because changes are going to be driven more than today by technology. And the relationship with the clients, the way we behave, the way we interact, the way we charge services through the new technologies 
mainly digital banking, will probably change the retail industry. And the retail industry, in the context we, we have uh, today in this panel, is very important because retail provides liquidity. And liquidity, of course, is crucial for the banking industry in the future. So mixing well the two and having a clever industrial approach on investment banking and retail will be crucial to win the fight uh, we, we are having. We have one hope, and the hope is banking union. Banking union is absolutely unavoidable. Uh, Europe will win only if banking union is implemented, well implemented, and quickly. It is needed. If we don't do it, fragmentation will continue, cost will be high, and the economy will not grow. It will be a toll on all the European economies, at least the Eurozone economies, which would be absurd. So banking union for us is a crucial ele element for growth and competitiveness. And this is key. I'm used to, to use a comparison which for some of you may go slightly too far, but you will allow my age to say this. In the 50s, we have been able to build the common market on the steel and coal agreement. I do believe that banking union will build the integrated market, which is an efficient market with as cheap as possible services. So we have unknown, we have challenges, but we have a big hope which has been provided to us by policymakers and regulators, it is banking union. So the, s the sooner is the better. Okay. From a policymaker point of view, Thomas, uh, I just wondered if, if you feel, we heard a fairly uh, in-depth analysis there, really, of, of, of the ways in which banks have changed and are planning to change going forward in terms of the structure of finance uh, and, and what they need to do internally in, in order to make themselves efficient enough to be able to service client needs. From a policymaker point of view, do you think that enough um, has been done and enough signals have been sent about how business models within banking will and, and should change for the sake of the economies? There, there's never enough. <laughs> um, and no matter how much information you provide, uh, it's, it still is not enough. But I, I must say, uh, probably there's been an undersupply uh, of such information. Just one example, think of the Lee Cannon report, uh, which uh, is languishing in some drawers uh, in Brussels and other capitals. Uh, there has been no uh, succinct uh, communication on what Europe proposes to do as a follow-up. And in the meantime, uh, several member states have started uh, preparing or even implementing uh, such rules which will lead to a tremendously uneven uh, playing field. So uh, in a true banking union, uh, this should not happen and this could not happen. Just as a quick aside, why do you think Likkanen is languishing in a drawer? <laughs> uh, there are some, <laughs> it's, it's like with, with marriages, uh, there are some who wanna be separated and others who don't want to be separated. Um, and at present, uh, the non-divorcees uh, appear to be uh, the stronger ones, to put it that way. And, and will it stay that way? Will it, will it just die as, a, as an idea? I think this will be uh, pushed by how other aspects of banking union uh, develop. And we've got a tremendous uh, amount of activity uh, in the remaining uh, weeks of this year with bringing uh, to final conclusion, the recovery and resolution directive, uh, we will be seeing uh, the next step in deposit guarantee schemes, uh, which is uh, an issue very unloved uh, in this country and in mine. Uh, we will, I'm quite sure, come to a uh, conclusion on the single resolution mechanism, which will not be perfect, but I think uh, will lead us into the direction uh, of actually integrating over time in a next step much, much more uh, in, in the Euro area. And all of that will increase uh, the push on policymakers that the remaining degrees of freedom of national action are also continuously hedged in. And that, therefore, should in late 2014 
uh, leaders, I hope, to take decisive action on the, on the follow-up uh, to Lee Cannon. So uh, we will by no means uh, in a year's time be where we should be. In reality, and that is something that is of uh, special concern uh, in this country here, in reality, I think we are lacking a very robust uh, legal basis within the treaty or a treaty, I leave that open, uh, for closer and ever closer integration in the Euro area, which we're doing right now, which is not challenged in front uh, of constitutional courts and therefore is some kind of risk not only to politicians who want to be re-elected, but it is a risk uh, for, uh, for the economy and for business uh, that they're building on something which may be legally challenged. So uh, over, over the next five years, I think it is of paramount importance to uh, actually have uh, a m much more robust secondary and primary law basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'd love to come to the, the, the future shape of, of the broad uh, European uh, structure of banking in, in, in the EU. Um, Jean just uh, mentioned a moment ago that um, banking union would basically be the secret for building an integrated market. Um, a, a single market, which we've been aspiring to theoretically in, in, uh, in financial services uh, for a very long time. Obviously, the crisis rather destroyed that, and we've seen um, regulators at a national level understandably try to, to ring fence their own uh, risks and um, forcing banks nationally to hold capital and liquidity uh, against those risks. Um, I just wonder, Klaus, from your point of view, um, are you confident that the the next year, uh, the, the asset quality review, the, the stress tests, and everything else that we're going to see in terms of the resolution uh, directive and so on, will be sufficient um, architecture in order to um, finally create a, a single market in banking? I think everybody on the panel agrees that banking union is a key element looking, looking ahead. And it's a one big element um, where we need to make a lot of progress still because we talked here about the fragmentation of markets and the associated costs of and all of that. Um, at the same time, I think it's one should not believe that banking union is the magic bullet. Um, many things have to come together and many things have come together already um, as we are moving out of this crisis. Everybody says we are not at the end of the crisis but we have made significant progress. And I think maybe it's important to, to show this broader context um, because the crisis response that was developed in the Euro area has about, I, I would say, four main elements. And the banking union is one of those, and that's the one where still most progress is, is needed. In the other areas, we have made significant progress. It's um, first the adjustment at the national level in the countries in the periphery, they have come a long way. Um, in this country, that's often underestimated. Um, it has been painful in the countries, but they have almost restored their competitiveness. They are implementing structural reforms. They are, have elim eliminated um, current account deficits. They have brought down fiscal deficits, just one number, um, which people are not, many people are not aware. According to the Commission forecast that was published last week, the Greek fiscal deficit next year will be 2% of GDP. That's less than in France or the Netherlands, for instance. There are only six countries in the Euro area that have a smaller deficit. It's amazing, um, considering that they came from 15.6% in 2009. Um, and they are implementing structural reforms, improving competitiveness. All countries are making progress. It's not over. They should continue. But that's the first element and that's what really counts in the end. Um, all the other things um, are helpful, but this is what really counts to move out of the crisis. The second element are the better rules and much broader and comprehensive rules for economic policy coordination, because that's what many academics all often argued, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, that a monetary union with centralized monetary policy and one exchange rate, but decentralized fiscal and structural policies cannot work. I think it can work, but of course it has to be coordinated. And we have now many, many rules, maybe too many, it's two, six, 
two-pack, six-packs, um, European semester, fiscal compact. Um, these are important rules. Um, and with that, monetary union can work better. The third element are institutional gaps that have been closed. There were no backstops, no fiscal backstops, which may also be, to some extent, banking backstops, EFSF, ESM. ESM is a permanent international institution. 90% of the ESM lending capacity is uncommitted. There's a lot of money available in case of need. Um, to these institutional innovations, I would also count what the ECB is doing these days and what they are prepared to do, which they wouldn't have been prepared to do before the crisis, including OMT, an efficient combination of ESM capabilities and ECB capabilities. So a lot of progress and all of that. And then banking union is, for me, the fourth element where the first decision has been taken. Um, as we have explained on this panel, um, we are in the middle of the negotiations on, on other elements, on the backstops, on the single resolution mechanism, single resolution fund. I'm confident it will happen. I think it has become so clear that this is the one missing link. But one has to see it in the overall context um, to assess whether we have made enough progress and, and how the euro area will look like a year, two, three years from now. Okay, thank, thank you for that overview. Um, just let me turn to Andrea, because I know you feel passionately about this topic of um, a single market and, and the whole way in which we, we need to strive towards it. You, you said as much uh, in an interview with the, the FT at the beginning of this week. Maybe you could, for, for those who haven't heard you talk on this, uh, maybe you could I explain your your thinking and um, also how confident you are about the the ongoing exercises over the next year um, actually creating finally that single market. Yeah, no, I, I, I also am in the camp of those who think that the, the banking union is uh, a major step in repairing the function of the single market. I mean, in a sense, uh, uh, let's say we could say that uh, uh, the... Um, it was a flaw in the design, in a sense there, which was leading to the uh, breakup of cross-border banking in the, in, the, in, the, in the single market. So repairing that will go a long way in repairing the problem. However, let's say th there is a broader issue that, that, that should bother us. Uh, in a sense, first of all, the state of the single market is, is, uh, is, uh, is not good. I mean, it, it has been seriously disrupted. I was looking at data recently and uh, uh, it is interesting to know that not only cross-border banking has, uh, has declined uh, uh, steeply, uh, but also what is interesting in my view is that the uh, claims uh, of uh, banks on their foreign affiliates have reduced significantly in the order of magnitude of more than one trillion within the euro area only, uh, which means that, uh, let's say, uh, even the, the, the cross-border groups, which have been the, the engine of the integration of the single market, are now, let's say, segmenting their activities in, on a jurisdiction-by-jurisdiction jurisdiction basis. Uh, this is not only a neuro area uh, aspect, no? I mean, uh, if you look at the, uh, we are monitoring 43 cross-border groups, and uh, uh, only five have uh, a business only within the euro area. I mean, most of them, uh, two-thirds of them have significant, uh, of, the, of the groups headquartered in the euro area have establishments, uh, significant establishments in other member states and the other way around. So two-thirds of the groups headquartered in, uh, in, the, in the UK, in the other member states which will not participate in the banking union as est have establishments in the, in, the, in the euro area. So how do you uh, keep these together? I, I think that there are... The more I think of it, I mean, there are a lot of issues that need to complement, in my view, the banking union to keep the single market uh, as, a, as, a, as a relevant concept moving forward. But I think that two are really the crucial ones. I mean, the first one is the single rule book. I mean, uh, uh, if you have differences in rules, if you have national discretions which are exercised differently within the, uh, the SSM and outside the SSM, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, um, macroprudential tools that are used in a very different fashion within and outside the, the, the SSM, you risk having capital trap and liquidity trap into, into jurisdiction. You risk having a rift uh, opening, opening up. So I, I do really think that we need to have the same rules in a number of areas. We have done a lot of progress here, but let's say there are still some areas in which we, we could do more, I think. 
Um, the second, which is maybe the most important, I think, is really uh, recovery resolution planning. I mean, now the cross-border groups will have to sit uh, around the table, produce their recovery plans. The authorities responsible for these groups will have to sit around the table and agree how they, were going, they are going to deal with, the, with these groups in case of a resolution. And uh, uh, again, I, I, I really think that uh, everything boils down to that, because if you are concerned that in a case of a crisis, everybody will mind its own backyard, well, then you will have, a, by backward induction, let's say, you will have an incentive to be uh, protective and ring fencing already in good times. So the single market uh, is going to remain, uh, let's say, impaired to some extent. If you are going to build instead a robust uh, institutional setup for agreements that are credible, reliable, can be enforced in a crisis for these cross-border groups, well, then you can have a much more integrated uh, way of, uh, of functioning because you know that in case of a crisis, you have a clear way of, uh, uh, of dealing with the, uh, with the issue. So I think that we really need to, uh, to devote our attention there. And this is an area in which I do have some concerns because I've seen, again, at the table of the, of the preparation of the legislation, Understandably, I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong, I understand this is very politically sensitive, so I understand that uh, uh, member states have different preferences, they want to fight their corner, they want to also to maintain some degree of flexibility, which is uh, in this area very, very important. Uh, but still, the more flexibility you have in the legislation, the more likely is that in, in times of conflicts, you might uh, end up having difficulties in managing this in a, in a, in a joined up fashion. Vito, could I just ask you um, a bold question? Do you, given uh, the, the point that Andrea alluded to in terms of the, the challenge of, of maintaining a single market uh, with a, a very large single supervisory mechanism as a, as a subset of that, uh, that broader EU, do you, do you think um, the concept of a single market is, is doomed? That we're, we're really, we're uh, it's a Eurozone market that will, will prosper? Yeah, not at all, uh, because we are, we are going to be supervisors and not regulators, meaning that the regulation is uh, approved at the council level and uh, under proposals by the commission, and then EBA will continue to uh, be uh, the entity responsible for secondary regulation and technical standards, which will be for the 28 countries. So, and we have to obey all those uh, legislations uh, that uh, define the single rule book that Andrea just mentioned. We cannot change that. Um, we have all to operate within that. Of course, we will be a force to uh, uh, further integration, no doubt about it. Uh, uh, for many reasons, the more important one being that uh, doing well uh, our job, it means that uh, uh, banks can trust each other in a much better way than now. And that, of course, uh, will again restore uh, cross-border flows, uh, will fight uh, fragmentation. It will be a very powerful instrument really to further uh, banking and financial integration. But that has nothing to do with the uh, rules of the game. The mm -hmm. rules of the game will be defined and will be the same uh, for the 28 countries. Mm -hmm. So I hope uh, that this uh, is not lost uh, and that no uh, bad decisions will be taken uh, uh, on the basis of unfounded fears about what will result from the SSM, which by the way, it's an open system. So any other member country that does not uh, participate in the Euro can join the SSM. Jean, I sense a, a, a certain skepticism from you of that view. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not skepticism, but smile. It means that I have left the official sector a long time ago, <laughs> and I have forgotten the uh, subtle distinction between single market and, you know, the, the wordings are very interesting. Here, my colleagues are speaking one of the single market, the other one about the integration of the single market, yeah. and I speak about an integrated market. So I will not speak as a former official, but as a banker. What do we speak about? We speak about an integrated market. The rules are the one of a single market. I no difficulty. But the extraordinary thing which is happening today 
is the creation of an integrated market, a market in which there's no national <coughs> border because there is one entity in charge of supervision, there is free allocation of liquidity, and one entity making sure that the assets are of high quality. This is an integrated market. And that, believe me, will free huge potential for clever funding of the European business, wherever is the business. Today, it is fragmented. We know this well. BNP Paribas is operating and retail banking in many countries. We know it. The hope of the integrated market is a source of efficiency and growth. We do not see as a bank, as normal, that the same quality of company, exactly the same, let us suppose you have exactly the same company, same product, one located, let's say in Germany, the other one located northern Italy. The cost of funding is not the same. Why? The currency is the same. There is something wrong in the system today. It is fragmentation. And just to make it efficient with a clever allocation of resources on an integrated market will free potential. That's why I have understood the rules are the rules of a single market, but the efficiency is the efficiency of an integrated market. Yes. Yep. Once again, BMP is quite an interesting case study for this because um, I remember a year or two ago you, you, you mentioned your uh, subsidiaries that you have in various jurisdictions. You have a big operation in Italy, and a, a year or two ago you set about uh, reducing that Italian operation's reliance on Paris because, partly because of this whole shift towards ring fencing of liquidity and so on. Uh, interesting that in the past few days it's emerged that you are uh, bidding for uh, a, a, a Polish uh, potential takeover, which suggests to, to me at least that um, you're confident, as, as you've suggested now, in this single market being uh, created anew and the, 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 the viability really of, of a cross-border bank in, uh, in Europe. So uh, that's a hopefully an optimistic uh, note on which to, uh, to make it. Please, I make no comment on Poland. Of course not. No comment on any potential deal, <laughs> but on the conclusion I agree. We are confident on the power of an integrated market. Very good. Um, we're, we're getting uh, short of time, so um, I know uh, there, there may be people in uh, the audience that might want to ask some questions. So um, I think we've had a, a good, lively debate here, but uh, it would be great if we could liven it up a bit more with some controversial questions from the floor. I think our colleagues here have some microphones, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand and they will come your way. Do we have anybody? Anybody who's got? Yeah, please, just over here. If you could um, just say who you are. And yeah, hi, my name is Chris Eckund from the Deutsche Bundesbank. I'm working in policy. Um, thanks very much to every one of you for this lively debate. Um, I have a question, uh, especially to m Mr. Lemire, as uh, you mentioned that investment banking and market-based funding is becoming the rule. Um, what impact will structural banks' operation, for instance, according to the Lee Conan uh, proposal for the French or German uh, structural banks' operation laws, uh, have on funding in the Eurozone or in Europe in general? Uh, well, it's... It's a good and difficult question. Uh, so I'll make it simple. Probably I will miss uh, one or two points. Uh, the the basic, basic view we have is facing the challenges of adjusting, uh, shifting to a different uh, business model. Uh, we, we have to be careful and uh, keep the capacity to act for the reasons I've mentioned. We understand that 
policymakers uh, can have concern on some activities of, of some banks. Proper trading, for instance. And we have seen no difficulty, uh, for instance, in the French law, you know it, the new banking law, saying that these activities uh, can be managed uh, but only in a separate entity. To that extent, we, we understand that there can be a restructuring of activity. We have always said that we would have a concern uh, going further, especially in the current environment of adaptation. Why? Because what is at stake is the service to the client. And we do believe that in the current environment, uh, universal banking is a good system. Universal banking is exactly at the crossroad of supply of credit by banks and capacity to, to use the markets to fund the corporate sector. And this is a time when the knowledge we have about clients is crucial to help them to go to the markets. So we, we do believe that breaking that universal banking model would be a mistake. So no difficulty to shift apart some activities which have nothing to do with clients, that for sure, but certainly a strong focus on maintaining a system which is crucially needed in Europe today. And it has nothing to do with the divorcing story of Tommy. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions from the floor? I don't think I can see. Ah, yes, just one, one up in the corner. Did you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, clearly, there will be another crisis uh, in an integrated market. How do you deal with it, Peter? Yeah, well, uh, to start with, uh, we are talking about a fully integrated market uh, in the uh, euro area. And the euro area already has one lender of last resort. So that's one uh, instrument that uh, since 19th century, since central banks uh, were invented and started to operate, uh, has been one of the functions to ensure uh, the stability of the financial system and to uh, uh, provide liquidity to solvent banks when there is a financial crisis. So the fact that there is a monetary union at the same time is a big uh, asset uh, to deal with any future crisis. Uh, the other thing is that if we indeed we are talking about banking union, which at least should include, besides the single supervisor, a single resolution mechanism, and in particular, I would say for cross-border banks, it means also that banking union will have that instrument to restructure banks and to deal with resolution of banks uh, in a common way. And uh, it's very important, the existing of that, because the supervisor can only do its job correctly if it feels reassured that it can send a bank to resolution with uh, the guarantee that the resolution will be quick, will be efficient, and will be orderly. Because if that guarantee does not exist, of course, any supervisor will hesitate to send a bank to resolution. So if there is a crisis, it is important that these two elements of the banking union operate at the same time and operate together. So here you have already uh, common elements that will make it easier than last time in 08 to deal with a general banking crisis. 
in 08, there was no single supervisor. There was no single resolution. It was difficult, and we have several examples, of s resolving some cross-border banks. Uh, because in spite of all the goodwill and coordination and cooperation over the years between national supervisors, when the problems really were there, we saw that it was difficult for them to reach an agreement. So we need an European perspective and all that. So banking union and monetary union will work together to deal better with any uh, future financial crisis. I think Klaus had something to add. Yes, I fully agree with what Vito said. But maybe one, one point of warning. Um, there will be a next crisis, but we don't know where it will come from. That's also clear, I think. It will probably come from an area that we don't anticipate today. And therefore, I think in a very general sense, in addition to what Vito talked about, better, stronger institutions, institutions that are much more able to solve problems cross-border very quickly, one should have a system where vulnerabilities are reduced in a very general sense. I think that's a healthy approach. And reducing vulnerabilities can happen through many ways. It starts by reducing public debt or not letting public debt go up too much. And that's maybe something that's not shared by, by all academics in the Anglo-Saxon world, but I think that's a traditional German view. Um, vulnerabilities can also be reduced by either letting banks not get too big, too big to fail, or if they are very big, um, these efforts to have living wills, um, reduce balance sheets, deleveraging in an area where it doesn't hurt um, the loan book. Um, we know that that balance sheets of many banks um, grew exponentially um, the 10 years before the crisis without the loan book going up at all. Um, so all these interbank deals need to be looked at very carefully whether it's really necessary. Um, I think a smaller balance sheet with the same loan book can also reduce vulnerabilities for future crises where nobody knows where it comes from. And of course, to pick up on that very point, um, given that nobody knows where it comes from, we, we don't know, of course, that it will come in banking at all. Yep. It uh, is perhaps yeah. more likely to come in the non-banking sphere where a lot of the risk is currently being transferred. But on that uh, slightly bleak note, uh, I'm afraid we need to, to wrap up the session. So um, thank you so much to all uh, my panelists here. Uh, again, I think it was a, a very interesting debate, certainly from my point of view. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.